Hey, welcome to the 2911 Church Podcast. We are so glad you're joining us. So sit tight. I encourage you to like be all in as you listen to this week's message. Be encouraged. We love you, church. And we're moving into uh, just a, a subject and this weekend. I'm so excited if you're online, if you are in person. I have not had a lot of coffee, so this is pure Holy Spirit, okay? Um, and uh, I just want you to know that I'm pumped because God is moving and the Holy Spirit's moving. Amen? Amen. And so the first week we looked at the power uh, of the Holy Spirit as we opened up the book of, everybody say Acts. Yeah. The book of Acts. And we looked at who is the Holy Spirit and how can we be filled today? Who wants to be filled with the Holy Spirit in this place? All right. <laughs> All right, and who's at home saying it too? You can yell in your kitchen, all right. Um, week two, Pastor Kirsten, one of the best messages I've ever heard on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you haven't heard it, you need to get online and break into it because it's all about the, what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is and how it can change our lives. And what I love about her, and she's been in kids ministry 10, 12 years, and she was able to break it down for us just so basically. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I need somebody to break it down because I got a kid brain, all right? You know what I'm saying? Um, and I know a lot of you do too. All of you do, um, no doubt. Um, past, Pastor Carl on week three talked about our salvation story, right? And how the Holy Spirit fills us, and how we filled the Apostle Paul, but it wasn't easy at first. Remember, I mean, the Apostle Paul had a conversion that was like, you know, amazing, and the Holy Spirit filled him, and he became, not, not, he was the persecutor of Christians and became the leader of Christians, right? Only God can do that. And last week, Jen looked at how persecution and suffering, like threaded through the book of Acts, actually caused the church, everybody say grow, Grow. to grow in numbers and in spirit, and how we can grow in the midst of our struggles and our persecutions, right on? And and so we've got just a couple more weeks. Zion's going to finish it next week as we talk about getting out of the four walls, because we're moving pretty soon, right? (laughs) Um, but I tell you what, God is going to move us into a place and allow, um, allow the Holy Spirit to use us um, to reach people that maybe would have never known unless we moved there, right? And so this week, I'm excited about this weekend because we're going to be talking about a subject that, that is really close to my heart. And if you've got your app, you can open it up because we're going to be looking at Acts 2. Um, you can open up your version electronic app, or if you bought, brought a real Bible tonight um, or this weekend, you get a free Jeremiah's drink because that is incredible. Incredible, all right? So bring your Bibles. If you got, I'll, well, I'll buy you one after, um, no doubt. They might be closed, but it's okay. Um, and we're going to read out of Acts 2, starting verse 42 to 47. Are you ready? Are you ready, church? Are you ready online? Okay, one of my favorite parts of Acts. It says, all the believers, everybody say devoted. Devoted, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and the sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, because the Lord's people got to eat. You know what I'm saying? Amen. And together and to prayer. And I love this. A deep sense of awe came over them all. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared. Everybody say shared. Yeah. They shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, at 2911 each day, um, <laughs> met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. With great joy and generosity. Important. All the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of the people. And it says, and each day the Lord added. Everybody say added. And they added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Amen? Amen. Here's a phrase I want you to hear, and this is where we're going. A deep sense of awe came over them. The awe of what? The awe of God, right? And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And I am so pumped because we are talking about miracles this weekend, all right? We are talking about signs and wonders and miracles, all right? I mean, this is the real stuff. And so I want you to place your hand on your heart. And I want you to pray with me, Lord, open our hearts because you are a God of the impossible. As we sang about, you are a God of the miraculous and you are a God of signs and wonders. And so we say, God, we are just so honored that we get to be a part of seeing what you do in your name. Everybody said, everybody say miracles, Miracles. everybody say miracles. miracles. 
miracles. I mean, they are found threaded through the word of God, right? And since we're looking at the book of Acts um, and we're studying the book of Acts and we have been the last four weeks, this is week five. I wanna look at the book of Acts alone. I mean, this doesn't even count what God has done and threaded through the Old and New Testament. The book of Acts records at least 20, everybody say 20. 20. 20 specific miracles and tells nine times of when clusters of miracles occurred. I like that. I mean, we got the sound of rushing wind in Acts 2.2, tongues of fire in Acts 2.3, the miraculous speech of Peter in Acts 2.4, the layman healed in Acts 3, building shaken uh, because the believers were praying in Acts 4, the sudden death of Ananias and Sapphira. Now, that was a weird miracle in Acts 5. Imprisoned apostles freed by an angel in Acts, um, in Acts 5 as well. Philip transported from the death desert, right, to another location in Acts 8, a light and a voice at Saul's conversion in Acts 9, Saul blinded and healed, Acts 9, Ananias, different Ananias, healed of paralysis because he wasn't raised from the dead, but anyways, this is a different guy, Um, he was raised from paralysis in Acts 9, Dorcas, I love her name, don't you love Dorcas? Name your child Dorcas and they'll never forget it. You know what I mean? And either one. Dorcas restored to life. That lady was brought back to life, people. Um, Herod's violent death in Acts uh, 12 because that was an important part of what needed to happen for believers to move forward. Eliamus the sorcerer was blinded in Acts 13. Um, The crippled Alistra was healed in Acts 14. Demons cast out of a slave girl in Acts 16. Paul freed from prison by earthquake in Acts 16. Eutychus raised from the dead. Another one in Acts 20. Paul unaffected by by a viper's bite, yes, snakes can't take away our faith in God, Acts 28, and the father of Publius uh, was healed in Acts 28, and it ends with his healing, everybody say amen. amen, and then we've got like nine more clusters of miracles, of different things that happened from signs and wonders, um, done by the apostles to Stephen doing great signs and wonders, and it says in Acts 28:9, the rest of those on that island where Paul was when that snake came, um, we had diseases all came and they were, everybody say healed. Healed. God was moving. Amen. Amen. And what we need to know about the book of Acts, and it's easy to think, oh, did that all happen in like, you know, 30 minutes or 30 days, but that was over 25 to 50 years. God was moving and that helps us get a timeline to go, wow. I mean, God spread out those miracles. It might seem overnight. And sometimes in our lives, we're like, gosh, would you do something, God? But God is always working on our behalf. And the miraculous is always around us. Because here's a wrong assumption about miracles. And this is why it's exciting to talk about because there's a reality to miracles. The fact that many miracles occur doesn't mean that every believer should always expect one whenever he faces a problem, right? God didn't always bring miraculous deliverance from danger and suffering to his children. And as Jen talked about, persecution and suffering was a part of the apostles' life as well. I mean, Christianity ain't no Disneyland people, right? We tend to think that, hey, you get saved, and then it's like, miracle, miracle. God's just going to push it all away. But God so often through his word uses hardship and struggle and hoping for the miracle to push growth out of us. He's not a mean guy on the throne, but he knows what's best for our character, and he knows the best way that we understand and we learn, and so we have to trust that, amen? Because here's the truth. Peter and John were arrested in prison and beaten in Acts 4. Stephen was stoned to death in Acts 6. Christians were scattered through persecution in Acts 8. James was executed in Acts 12. Paul was stoned in Acts 14. Paul and Silas arrested, beaten, placed in stocks in Acts 16. Paul was arrested and tried, chapters 21 to 28. And then Paul, during this period, was whipped with 39 lashes five times, beaten with rods three times, shipwrecked three times, adrift on the sea for 24 hours, is often sleepless, hungry, thirsty, and cold, yet he still said, God is the God of miracles. Come on, somebody. You need to hear that tonight, that God is the God of miracles no matter what. I mean, this is the truth, and you got to understand that miracles are beautiful, but it's obvious that God did not perform miracles just to make life easy and pleasant for his children. Miracles were part of of a greater sign. Somebody say, what? What What is a miracle? And I have people all the time ask me, you know, if they've seen a miracle, what is a miracle? Pastor Mark, I don't know if I've ever seen a real bona fide miracle in my life. I hear that sometimes, all right? 
so what is a miracle? Well, if we define miracle in, in the English language, um, it's a surprising and welcome event that is like inexplainable by, by natural or scientific laws and is therefore considered to be the work, I love this, of a divine agency, AKA Holy Spirit people, all right? Um, so synonyms of miracles are mystery, I mean, phenomena, wonder. Everybody say marvel. marvel. Not the Marvel movies, but a marvel, right? Okay, um, yeah, I knew. <laughs> I was trying to be super cool. Um, so what does the word miracle mean in Hebrew? Well, it's pronounced mofeth, and it means token. Um, it means miracle. It, it, you know, it means miracle. Um, I tried to go deeper with it, but it didn't go there. All right. The word miracle in Hebrew means miracle. Okay. Um, what does the word miracle in Greek mean? Well, it means dunamis, and we talked about that word, right? It's a force, a power, and it points to a higher force that is entrusted and, and working um, in our world, right? Yeah. Here's the truth. The miracles were not just used to bless the people um, in the book of Acts or the new believers, and I think we get this confused, and that's why this message is so important, because sometimes we feel like, well, if I haven't seen a miracle or I'm not seeing it right now, or I prayed for a miracle and it doesn't happen, then I'm a loser. I'm a loser Christian, and that's not the truth, because here's the truth of miracles. Miracles in the New Testament church and through the ministry of Jesus and the apostles were always about bringing attention and focus to God. They weren't just to bring us out of pain and suffering and sorrow. I mean, that's an added part of the miraculous. Yeah. Maybe you get the chance to live another life or you get the chance to like, like have a new organ or maybe you get the chance to like financially be debt free. I mean, these great miracles we're gonna talk about in a minute are a part of our lives, but they're not there just for us to feel good. Yeah. Miracles are a testimony that God is who he says he is, yes. that he is who he is. And the purpose of miracles in the book of Acts was to perform and authenticate the ministry of the apostles and the, authenticate the ministry that Jesus had left behind so the Son of God could be glorified because the miracles are not about us. The miracles are always about making his name famous and his, his ministry famous. Right? Ride that bus. Amen, right? So what can miracles teach us? And this is where I want to go for a few minutes before we pray for miracles. Are you ready to pray for some miracles in this place? I want you to start thinking about this. Some of you are like, oh no, we're gonna pray again. <laughs> I gotta get out of this church, you know. <laughs> we're gonna pray again because we believe in the power of prayer, amen? And we're gonna pray for that. So you don't need to hear my voice very much tonight. What you need to hear is God's voice. But I want you to know that here's some things that miracles can teach us and what we can learn. The first thing is this, is the greatest miracle is salvation. The greatest miracle of all is salvation, my friends. Don't get it confused with seeing something. It is what's happening in your heart, right? Because miracles are not just physical. We get tied up in Western culture, and you know, in Western Christianity, American Christianity, that the physical ones are like the, the cream de la cream, right? They're like the, the best thing. If, if God could do this one thing, it would be better than anything. But it's not better than anything. Because a miracle won't get you into heaven. Knowing Jesus Christ personally in a relationship that's passionate is where we find ourselves unlocking the opportunity to not be separated from God for a lifetime. Salvation is the miracle, right? Ephesians 2.8, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift. Everybody say gift. It's the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Romans 5.8, but God demonstrates his own love for us. Well, we were still sinners, yet Christ died for us, right? And that means it's a gift. That means salvation's important. Romans 8, 320, Romans 3, 25, 26. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. That's the miracle that Jesus came down and was a part of us and said, I'm gonna give my life for you. So we no longer had to do animal sacrifices and all that chaos and be in separation of God, that we could be with him. The veil was torn. That is the miracle. So don't get that messed up when people are like, well, I'm not seeing miracles. Oh, if you've found Christ, you've seen a miracle, my friend, in your life. You know you've seen a miracle. So know that. That gets me excited because the greatest miracle of all is salvation. Eternity is a miracle. Amen? 
Another thing you got to know about miracles is miracles come in all shapes, sizes, and forms, right? Have you figured that out? I mean, miracles are like diamonds. There's so many sides to the definition of what a miracle is. And we tend to try to like list and the miracle is only this thing and the miracle is only in that thing. And I tell you what, God works outside the lines of what our human minds can think. Because there's miracles happening in this room this weekend and online this weekend right now. God is moving and there's a miraculous move that's happening. And so I want to break down to what maybe we can kind of like maybe uh, categorize so that you can understand that miracles aren't just one thing. And the first thing is that there's a spiritual miracle. And we just talked about it, about that. The miracle of salvation. Like when you see somebody accept Christ, or maybe you have found Christ and you're like, how on earth did I get here? And it's only the grace of God, right? I mean, you look at great men like C.S. Lewis. I'm going to give you just an example of a, of, an, of a miracle. He was an intellectual atheist. This guy was smart. He taught it at Oxford in Cambridge. And the fact that he found Jesus Christ personally is miraculous. And out of that miracle, I mean, so many other theologians and individuals through the course of the last 100 years, their lives have been impacted because Lewis found the gift of salvation. That's a spiritual miracle. I think of a more personal miracle in the room. Pastor Carl Feller is a guy that I love and know. And the reason why he's a personal miracle in, in, in my eyes and what I get the chance to watch is I saw that kid at 14 years of age come down to an altar and accept Jesus. And that guy has not turned back. Amen. That's a miracle of salvation. Okay, right? And on Wednesday night, I'm sitting at Alpha. The room is full of new believers and believers trying to go farther. And I'm thinking, what a miracle. Here's a kid at 14 that found God and now at 40 is serving God with his whole life. And here he is leading believers to know Jesus more. That is a spiritual miracle, my friends. And we can't hold back on that, right? I mean, think of your life and the lives around you. Look around this room. Some of your fathers and mothers have found Christ, right? That's a miracle. Some of your siblings and family members, some people that you work with, like you've never thought that they could find Jesus. Some of your friends and coworkers, and there's many miracles yet to come, amen? amen. Then there's physical miracles, and these are the ones that are tangible. These are the ones we want to see. These are the ones we want to almost pay money for, right? We'll line up outside conference centers, and we want to see the physical, and we forget that the physical isn't just the only miracle um, that's out there, but it's a good miracle, and God does move physically. I mean, some individuals believe that miracles don't exist anymore. I mean, that when Jesus left and the apostles died out, that key part of God was used for those times, and that's it. But you got to know, healing and physical healing has always been a part of God's nature from the beginning, all right? Because healing is present through the Bible. I mean, David wrote, he wrote this in the Psalms. He said, Lord, I exalt you and I lift you high for you have lifted me up on high over my boasting, gloating enemies. You made me triumph. And then he says this in verse two. He says, oh Lord, my healing God, I cried out for a miracle and you healed me. Amen. You brought me back from the brink of death, from the depths below. Now here I am alive and well, fully restored. Amen. Amen. During times of sickness, in the Old Testament, they would call upon who? Jehovah Rapha. And that simple word in Hebrew means to cure, to restore, to make whole. And God is a God who can make whole. Amen. Amen. And I've got all kinds of testimonies that I could share with you about physical healing. My little brother who helped uh, an eight-year-old kid that was drowning, like literally helped him out of the water and then they were able to do CPR and then this kid actually lived. That's a physical miracle. I had a friend in Bible college. His mother was diagnosed with breast cancer. She went one week to the doctor and they said, you've only got this about 30 days to live. And she went, then the next week we prayed over her and you know what, she, she didn't have cancer at all anymore, all right? But I want to bring it to like a real personal level because sometimes it's easy for us to be like, well, I don't know. I don't know if I believe in that, Pastor Mark. And you got to know that, that, that Zach May, right in our own very community, one of our own grandkids, experienced like a major healing from God. In college in San Francisco on a baseball scholarship, um, you know, planning out his life. And a few years ago, he started not feeling so great. And I mean, long story short, went to the doctor and found out that he was diagnosed with a blood cancer, Hodgkin's lymphoma, lymphoma, and it wasn't just stage one, two, or three where we can treat it. It was stage four. Get your affairs together, Zach. So he came home and got his affairs together and tried to figure things out and at the same time did research and started to go, okay, God, I wanna, I wanna believe and I'm gonna pray. And so he did due diligence. He did three chemo treatments and said, I can't do it anymore. 
And on August 30th, 2019, he said, I went in for the scan that was going to stage my cancer diagnosis, not knowing what to expect or without a clue of what my results were going to be. And I, I, I did expect to go home. And, and this is the, the cool part is, is God was moving. And I want to show this first scan of what the cancer looked like in Zach. We're going to show that right here. So this was the, the, the lymphoma that was taking over his body, all right? So get this idea. I mean, the dark spots represent the cancer in his blood all through his body. And we're going to keep that up there for a minute. He said this. He says, before I could make it through the doors of the Mayo Clinic, my oncologist called, right? She, she asked me to go back in her office. I'll never forget her words um, as she showed me this scan. She said that, that I shouldn't leave the hospital and that I needed to start treatment as soon as possible and I might not make it through the weekend. October 19, 2019, he attended 2911 for the first time. Yeah. And I remember he was standing back here and kind of acting sketchy and like not talking to anybody <laughs> but his brother and... And then um, Jake Eckelman found me, and he's, and he's, I'm like, hey, did you meet him? You know me. I'm like, did you meet, did you meet Zach and his brother? Anyways, and Jake's like, you know what? I'm gonna just, I just feel like I'm supposed to go pray with him. I'm going to go find him and pray with him. Because at that point, we didn't know anything at that. Zach knew, but we didn't know. So Jake went and found him and just prayed over him. And Jack, I mean, Zach didn't fall on the ground and, like, you know, fillet and run around and, I mean, crazy and take his shirt off. And, I mean, it was just, it was just very calm. The Holy Spirit was moving. October 25th, 2019, sitting in my oncologist's office with my parents, reflected over the past months, I'm waiting for her to come in with, with these results, and the silence in the room was deafening. We were all holding our breath as she pulled up the results. What she showed me answered the countless prayers of people calling on God, and specifically what happened that night at 2911. I mean, we know this now, but she showed me this scan, and we want to show you this scan now that his cancer was gone, all right? That's his heart right there. His cancer was gone, all gone, and they didn't know what to say. Consider it a miracle. If you serve God, doctor basically said, then you have a miracle. God moves physically, my friends. You never know. And I, you never know. Emotionally. Joyce Meyer was sexually assaulted over 200 times by her father. She found Christ and allowed the word of God to wash over her mind. And over the course of about a decade, her heart was healed along with her memories. And you know her ministry now, she's in her 70s and has seen so many individuals come to Christ because God emotionally healed her heart. Deb and Jerry Gray, you see a marriage in this place that at year 13, 14 was on a destitute road and they were calling it quits. And it took about a year, two, two years of you know, reconciliation. But Deb and Jerry Gray made the choice to allow God to perform that miracle of bringing them back together. And because of that, some of you are staying and are back together and have healthy marriages or healthy lives because of what God did in their life. God emotionally heals. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Financially, financial miracles. I mean, I'm a way that is unexplainable. God can do something financially. And sometimes it doesn't just come by us saying, God, fill my bank account, right? Yeah. Because Sam and Dee Dee, I mean, this amazing story, you know, they found they were in heavy, heavy debt from school loans and car loans and this, this and that. And, and like, like $70,000, $80,000 of debt, my friends. And they sat down at a financial piece and said, we got to change some things. The miracle was that somewhere along the way, Dave Ramsey had a miracle in his life, spread that miracle to somebody else and gave Sam and Didi a chance. And they paid that debt miraculously off in a very short amount of time and now are debt free, all right? God can perform financial miracles through wisdom. And you say, well, that's great, Pastor Mark. That's great for those people. And, and maybe you wonder, well, what if the miracle doesn't happen for me? Well, here's the hard, cold truth. The definition of a miracle is sometimes our definition, not God's definition of what a miracle is. We clump, categorize, listen, decide what's a miracle, what's not a miracle. And here's the question that we have to answer, and this is so important because this is what the apostles in the book of Acts had to ask themselves. What if heaven's will is such a mystery that we'll never understand it? Will we still blindly trust God? When you're beaten 39 times, shipwrecked, I mean, you got a viper in your face, do you still believe that God is the God of miracles? Because if you believe in God and who he says he is, then yes, you do. 
In Psalm 56, David wrote, I praise God for what he has promised us. Yes, I praise the Lord for what he has promised. The scripture doesn't say, I praise God for all the promises he will do for me. It says, I will praise God for what he has promised. Whether you do it or not, you are a God of promises. And you know what? I'm going to hold fast to that. Because all through the course of the Bible, there are over 7,147 promises from God to man in the Bible. Do we think that he can't move, that he can't do it? And then if he says that he will take care of those promises, then we have to blindly trust him. And at some point, we got to mature past this focus of me, 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 my miracle. I didn't see miracles. God doesn't like me. We got to get past ourselves and we got to just trust him blindly. And it's a point of no return that we get to in our faith that says, whether the miracle happens or not, I'm going to serve God with everything that's within me. And then we just take it day by day and step by step. Amen. I'm a big believer in praying until the final breath. I don't want you to come to my hospital room or find me on the street if you don't have faith and you are just more of a negative doubter. Because I want somebody who will stand over me if I'm supposed to live longer or I'm supposed to be healed in that aspect that has the prayer of faith, that will lay their hands on, on me and say, in the name of Jesus. Because if you're going to stand back and observe and watch and say, nope, God can't do it, I don't want you there. And I'm sitting and st- I was standing, Jake and I were standing next to Cody, who liver heart transplant guy, remember? On Friday, they said, I don't think he's going to make it through the weekend. And we're standing next to him, and you can feel the fever on his body, and we're laying our hands on him. And I'm like, God, I have no idea, but I do not want to stand before you someday. And you say, Mark, you prayed weak. Pray strong. And strong isn't yelling and screaming. Strong says, I don't understand God, but I'm going to lay my hands on the sky, and I'm going to pray in the name of Jesus that you and your will would be done. Whatever that is, I'm going to trust you because it's a win-win for Cody. If he lives, it's a win because he gets to spend more time here. But if he does not, and the will of God is for him to be with you, he wins because he found you two months ago, God. That is a miracle, and salvation is the greatest miracle. So I'm going to lay hands on him, and I'm going to pray for your will to be done. That's what God's looking for. My mom passed away last week, 95, on, and she was on hospice. She lived an additional four years from when they originally said, hey, your mom's not going to make it a couple more months. I don't understand why, but I want to live a life that creates a place for the miraculous no matter what. I mean, we got to get to this point where we stop getting mad at God when things don't go our way, when we stop stubbornly talking to God, when the things that we want and the miracles we, that we think should happen don't happen. We, gotta, we just got to say, God, I'm with you heart and soul. I don't get it. This is a mystery, but I love you. And he gets it. He sees our grief, our sorrow, our expectations not get met. And if we lean into him, he's the greatest fulfiller and of hope no matter what. God is a God of the miraculous because all miracles are in the name of Jesus. Do you know that? Thank God miracles don't happen in the name of Mark or they wouldn't happen because I sure don't have the faith for it. But God's growing me and he's growing you because it's not based on us. It's based on his name. From the cross to the resurrection, all miracles give the glory to Jesus. We make his name famous, so it draws our eyes upon him, right? And I want you to know that sometimes we fail to see that the miracle God is wanting to provide is within us, right? I love this in Acts 4. Joseph of Cyprus says, all the believers were united in heart and mind, and they felt... And they felt that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. It wasn't mine, 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 mine. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon them all. And it says there were no needy people among them, because those who owned land and houses would sell them, bring the money to the apostles, and give to those in need. And then it says, for instance, there was Joseph, the one the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, which, need, which means son of encouragement. Oh, I want to be known for that. He was from the tribe of Levi and came from the island of Cyprus. He sold a field that he owned and brought the money to the apostles and said, hear God. Because there was a miracle that someone was waiting for, that somebody was going to receive. And it was because Joseph was obedient to bring that to the storehouse and say, here you go, God. The miracle, maybe for somebody else, maybe even for us, it's in our hands but we're too busy looking other places or trying to figure it out ourselves rather than being obedient and being good stewards of what we have. 
Ananias and Sapphira in chapter five, do you remember this? I mean, a little bit later, they sell their land too, but they lied about the portion and they experienced, we'll call it the miracle of death because they died in the moment because they were holding back from God. And we don't see maybe that miracle a lot in our culture and we don't want to, right? But here's the truth. Some of us are spiritually dying because we are holding so hard to what we have. And we're dying a much more terrible death because it's slow and our hearts are being drained because God's saying being obedient, being obedient, not just with our finances, but with our time, our talent, our treasure, but we're holding back on him. And he wants to use us so the miracles can continue. I mean, Christians, it's been said, and it'll be said again, that we're stingy, my friends. I'm gonna leave a dollar and a gospel track for that server. And that's the miracle we wanna leave behind for them, rather than the miracle of relationship and love and prayer and hope in that moment. I'm not saying it's wrong to do that, but ask any server that works out on a Sunday afternoon when churches are released and they'll tell you Christians are the cheapest. We should be the most giving because everything we have is his anyways. So let's do our best. I know you can't give everything away. That's not what God's asking. He's just saying, are you willing to open your hands? Are you willing to contribute and plant a seed? Because that seed could grow into the miracle tree that somebody needs. God wants to use you. My dad taught me to use what God's given you. At the age of 84, he was using that darn Buick he left me to take his younger friends to chemotherapy. And he told me, if you're blessed with a house, then fill it with a community group or dinners that welcome in the lost. If God's given you a car, then maybe use it to give somebody a ride to church. But Pastor Mark, it's out of my way. Exactly. If you've been blessed with finance and wisdom to build an awesome business, then use that to build the kingdom. If you know how to bake, then bake something that blesses the hands of those in need. Gosh, I got so many stories, but we need to pray. And here's the last thing I wanna share. The church in Acts set a climate for the miraculous. Are we, are you? Because God is wanting to lead the way to set up a culture for miracles because the miracles performed show the testimony of Jesus and draw people to him. But the big question is, is, do I live and speak a culture of miracles or do I live and speak the cancel culture that I live in? I mean, some of us live under our, our own cancer culture. I mean, we miss the culture of the miraculous. And what is a culture of the miraculous? Well, if you look through the book of Acts, it's simple. There's four things that we see that constantly preceded where miracles took place. The first was repentance, because we got to get rid of anything that's holding us back from God. We got to find some gratitude. There was gratitude, and there was constantly thanking and giving and saying, you know what? It's yours, God, anyways. Constantly saying, thank you, God, rather than give me God. The third thing was faith. They kept their hopes set high. And even if God didn't provide for them, but somebody else, they were joyful to say, guess what? God will provide for me because it's just who he is. I'm gonna let him do the miracle. And then the last thing is desperation. I said this to the 11 o'clock last week. I mean, you're getting off easy because you were your Saturday night. But I felt like in that, and we have such an awesome community, but I just felt like in that particular 11 o'clock service, it's like people were sitting there going, I don't know. I just don't know. And I got up and I just said, who's desperate for God? Because here's the problem in 21st century Western culture. We got everything at our hands, food, medicine. I mean, we don't need a lot. So we find ourselves maybe not as desperate for God as we need to be. Because I get this question all the time. Well, how come God moves in third world countries or other places of the world that maybe, you know, don't seem to have as much? Why is God working there and not here? Well, when you got to run your kid two miles that's sick to find any kind of help, you're desperate because you can't run across the street to the ER. And I'm not saying the ER is wrong because everything that God has given on this earth, the, the amazing wisdom of man, 
the chemotherapy that Zach encountered the three times he was there, the chemotherapy that Brenda's mom encountered and beat colon cancer and lived another four years, God uses the miraculous hands of man. But I'm telling you, how desperate are we to see the miraculous happen, right? Because I want to remind you of what happened in Samaria in Acts 8. But the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. Philip, for example, went to the city of Samaria and told the people, people about the Messiah. Crowds listened intently to Philip because they were eager to hear his message and see the miraculous signs he did. Many evil spirits were cast out, screaming as they left their victims. And many who had been paralyzed or lame were healed. And then it says this. So there was great joy in that city. Is there great joy in our community because of the miraculous? We have to ask ourselves that because we could be part of what God can do, not just to change Samaria, but to change Tempe and Mesa and Chandler and the East and the West Valley. God can use little us. He can use little us. He can use little you. He's just saying, believe. Believe that there can be miracles for marriages. Believe that bodies can be healed. Believe that salvation, the most important miracle, can happen for even the person you think might never find hope. This is the power of miracles. I don't know about you, but I wanna see joy in this city. I wanna see hope again in this place. And it comes as we lead the way and say, okay, God, I repent. I, I, I find gratitude. I, I'm going to give you faith and I'm going to be desperate for you. I'm not going to walk in every weekend and wonder, observing, should I get into it this weekend or not? I'm going to walk in ready for whatever you have. That's the believer that will see the miraculous as we see in the book of Acts. So would you stand with me and take a moment to close your eyes and just find a place of opportunity to say, God, move. If you're in this place and you've never accepted Jesus with every head bowed and every eye closed, and you maybe are recommitting your life maybe at this point because you, you lived for God at one time or maybe you're here, somebody invited you or you've been coming for a while, but you're just not where you need to be in your relationship with God. You wanna say, God, I'm sorry. I wanna live for you. It just starts the greatest miracle of all is salvation. Just lift your hand and say, I wanna find Jesus or I want to find Jesus again. I want to be my savior, my hope, my help, my greatest friend, my warrior, my strength. And you can put your hands down. What's up? And if you didn't have maybe the faith right now to, to raise that hand, but in your heart you want to, he's right there. All you have to say is, Jesus, come into my heart, come into my life. I want this relationship with you. And this great miracle is happening right now for some of you. And it is the greatest miracle. So allow that miracle to just go deep. Allow his beautiful love and grace to wash over you. Allow the shame and the guilt and the struggle and the hardship to feel lighter, to fade away because he loves you for who you are. And he died on a cross and was resurrected so you could have life and that joyful life that they found in the city of Samaria. And now for the rest of us, I'm going to ask our pastoral staff and team, they're going to come up. They've got green lanyards on that say, I am believing with you. And I just want us to create a place for the miraculous. You say, well, Pastor Mark, my miracle isn't like huge. It doesn't matter. What I need from God maybe is huge. It still matters. It all matters. And we want to create an opportunity for you to pray with you to agree with you in Jesus' name to pray about this. And it might take a moment. It might take a year. It might take a whole lifetime. We can't decide what a miracle is and what it's not. We're going to trust that God does. But if you need a miracle in your marriage, you need a miracle in your finances, you need hope, you need a miracle in relationship building in your life, you need a miracle because, I mean, there's depression, mental health. I mean, it's all real. And God wants to bring that miracle into your life. And the Bible says sometimes we don't have what we're, what we're needing because we don't ask for it. And we want to create for a few moments a place where we can ask for the miraculous. And I want you to know that God is with you in this moment. We've got friends that want to pray with you. Or maybe just even during 
this moment of worship that you can lift your hands and say, God, here's a miracle I've prayed for a bazillion times. I'm gonna pray for again. But let's believe that God is a God of the impossible. Amen?